Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started here. This is the, the second part of a two-part webinar on how to use the Damage Assessment Toolkit. And on the screen in front of you, you'll see your GoToWebinar ID, which you should already be logged into. And as an alternate, if you have any trouble getting into GoToMeeting, there is a, uh, a Join Me ID uh, as a backup there. So go ahead and make note of that address if you're having any connection difficulties at this time. And uh, of course, everyone should already be on conference call. Uh, if you would go ahead and press star six so we can mute your individual lines. I've already got everybody on lecture mode, but when we bring it, bring the conference call off lecture mode in the end, uh, when it's time to ask questions, you can hit pound six to unmute your phone. I'm Chris Lander, and uh, co-presenting with me today will be Parks Camp. He's from WFO Tallahassee. And um, Again, we'll be leading you through uh, about an hour webinar today with 30 minutes for questions on how to use the damage assessment uh, toolkit. Just a reminder that this webinar will be recorded uh, today and we'll have this video recording posted along with the PowerPoint onto the damage assessment toolkit Google site uh, by uh, later this afternoon uh, before I head home today. And uh, you can have that if uh, You've got folks that weren't able to uh, view the webinar uh, within your office uh, today, or you just need a refresher. Um, we'll, we will be taking questions uh, today throughout the webinar. So if you've got any questions, we ask that you enter in those questions through the chat window. There's a questions window uh, within the GoTo uh, meeting uh, feature, and we'll be uh, queuing up questions from GoTo meeting and answering all of your questions uh, at the end of the, the training session today. Um, and then once we've answered all your GoToMeeting questions uh, that have been queued up, we will give you a chance to ask some questions over the phone. Um, as I mentioned today, we'll be going for about an hour uh, of training with, uh, with 30 minutes for questions at the end. Now just a brief uh, summary again on the purpose of the training. I mentioned this yesterday, but I just wanted to reemphasize this. That the purpose of this training is to provide technical training on uh, how to operate and use the damage assessment toolkit. Um, so we will be answering mainly technical questions related to that operation of the toolkit. If you do have any questions related to the policy, procedure, directives um, related to the damage assessment toolkit, please uh, refer those questions to your MIC regional WCM or to AQUIS. Now this is the second part of a two-part webinar. This is all new content and not a repeat of yesterday's seminar. And uh, the, whole, uh, the whole purpose of today's webinar is we'll be walking you through the, the web editor and uh, how, to, how to use and QC the web editor, or use the web editor to QC the data once it's been uploaded from a mobile client and how to enter data through the web editor. And uh, also another large and very important part of the webinar today will be to cover some of the help resources and tech support resources that are already out there that will help you use the damage assessment toolkit effectively and get help when you run into problems. So we're going to start with a discussion of the, the existing damage assessment toolkit resources that are out there. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over the, the Google site, how to get to it, how to use it, and give you an overview of what is on that Google site. So you'll have some idea of, of what to do uh, as far as setup, as far as uh, going to the Google site first for getting help, and uh, knowing what's there uh, for your reference. And then also talk about the email listserv, which is the primary help mechanism that we have, and uh, where most of the issues and problems seem to get solved um, with, uh, with the damage assessment toolkit. I'll also talk about uh, a somewhat of a formal process for requesting help that we have. And then finally, I'll uh, give you another uh, opportunity to write down the passwords that are needed to access the damage assessment toolkit, both uh, to transmit the data from the laptop application and also to access the web editor application. So on this slide, I have a URL for the DAT Google site. Um, we were on a, a wiki last year, but we have, within the past uh, three to four months, 
migrated to a site is that's become a, an available resource for everybody to use in the web in the weather service. Um, we're using this site as the central location for all the documentation for the project. This is the location where you'll find setup instructions, operations instructions, uh, where you can get access uh, to the software, a link to the software to download. Um, this is where all of our procedures are, are outlined for support or providing feedback. Um, you'll see uh, the training and the webinar uh, archives linked within this stat resource. And you'll also uh, see the instructions for setting up uh, access to the listserv. So this is the, the DAT Google site. Um, this is just a screen capture of the front page. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to jump over there and kind of walk you through some of these, the more useful features and just give you a brief tour of how it's organized so you'll know where to go uh, when you have uh, issues that you need help with. Okay, so this is the main page here. And um, see on the main page, we've got a couple of sections here. Um, in red at the top, we'll always have some kind of a notice if there's been a recent change, some kind of a new development, um, something that everyone needs to take note of. We're going to post those on the front page, probably in red in this section here. Um, at the very top is just a, a general description of what the project is and some useful links out to, to the web editor and to the viewer. Um, and below here on the front page, we've got a quick start setup guide for both the mobile devices, uh, the iOS devices that are government owned, and then also the laptop application. We've got some, some key links on the front page for operation guides. And here you'll see links to the mobile, the laptop, and the web, edit, web editor application. Um, by the way, yesterday's training is linked through uh, the front page link here. There's also a section here on the front page for support and feedback. Um, another place that uh, you need to be conscious of, uh, at least using as a resource or knowing where the, the, the latest links are, are up here in the left-hand cor left corner you can see a link out to the DAT web editor, the DAT test web editor, and the DAT viewer. Those are your live links to get out to the cloud server and to load the application. And uh, those are now current with the uh, current cloud location. So if you happen to have bookmarked this, uh, this editor site, uh, you know, six months ago or even any time before uh, Monday, actually, um, you're going to want to take a look at this link and make sure that you're linking back to the current site because it has moved from the GIS dev uh, site and there is no forwarding link. So take a look at this link and make sure if you bookmark this that your bookmarks are now current. On the left-hand uh, side here below the links, we've got uh, an index of the site um, under this About section. This is just kind of informational type stuff on the project history, um, test offices that have participated in the past, uh, development team um, that's been uh, involved with developing the application. There's some documentation on the email listserv, which we'll get to here. Um, this is very important. This is also linked into the front, but these are your instructions for joining the Lyris uh, listserv. I've got this also documented in the, the PowerPoint presentation, but you'll want to go through and take a good look at this and make sure everyone is signed up on the listserv that is using um, the project. This is a, the primary method by which we communicate uh, issues with the project and, and self-help uh, self issues with the project. Um, there's an FAQ section. And then some general information on the laptop GPS uh, hardware. And some other general collection of links to do uh, to get out to uh, the OSIP project and um, some related uh, issues on Google Maps. Um, there's a bugs and enhancements section. If you're curious as to what bugs have been documented throughout the project or what we currently know about, or if your bug has uh, been documented on this project, you can take a look at, uh, at this uh, section here, and you can see our current list of bugs. 
And uh, also, same thing goes with future enhancements. If you're curious about uh, future enhancements or have submitted a request and want to see that your future enhancement request has been documented, you can head over to this, uh, this future enhancements page. And uh, there's also a, uh, a version change log if you want to see, um, if you're curious about uh, the, the various differences between the versions that have been uh, published and want to know what new features have been added. In the um, installation instructions section, the main page here gives you a, uh, a link or several links to, to set up and install both the, uh, the iOS Android BlackBerry installation, the mobile, app, mobile application installation instructions, and also the laptop installation instructions. So, all the relevant instructions are linked through this page, and uh, the software links are also in here. So the um, installation files that are required for uh, the mobile application and then also for the damage assessment toolkit laptop application are all linked through this section. And so the, I think I mentioned this yesterday, if you, if you want to install the laptop and you haven't received your DVD yet or you lost it, um, you can download all the, the files that uh, are required to install the, the laptop application. Uh, for the mobile application, this is simply the link that will take you out to the mobile uh, install site on the cloud server. You'll want to type this into your uh, device to get that software installed. Um, also on this page, we've begun to document the, uh, the different um, configuration requirements there, there are for the regions for that mobile application, and for example, if you are a central region office and you want to install that mobile application on a uh, government-owned iPad, iPhone, or a personal mobile device, these are your in instructions here for doing that. And we also have instructions for uh, southern region linked on that page. Uh, I do not yet have uh, configuration instructions for the other regions, but I uh, suspect that those are forthcoming, forthcoming in the near future here. Oh, also um, on this section, I also need to mention, um, if by chance you failed to, you didn't get the password uh, from the webinar, you forget what it is, you can always come to this section, and um, we don't post the password on the website anymore, um, but this is the group of people that you can contact, and we'll, uh, we'll, the phone, we'll phone the password back to you if you want to, um, if you want to uh, get the password after the, uh, the webinar is closed today. This section here, the operation instructions, this is just links back out to the, the operating instructions. So each one of the applications has got a, a set of fully detailed operation instructions associated with it. Training resources. Um, as I mentioned, the training from yesterday was recorded and the training today is being recorded. This is where those recordings are posted. It's going to be under this section here that says DAT Training Spring 2013. We've also got links out to the LMS module at the top. The LMS module currently contains the, the training from last year. Uh, if you want to get credit via the LMS module, last year's training is currently in there. As soon as the, the webinar is done today, I'm going to start working on getting this information posted and updated for spring 2013. I, I don't know how long it's going to take to do that, but uh, I would expect within the next month to two months that uh, we'll have the new stuff on the LMS, but that is where the link is out to the LMS module. Um, these are all the recordings and the PowerPoints, and you can even go back to last year's training if you're curious. I've got some of these videos embedded. I think I'm going to try that again with this stuff uh, that we're doing for spring 2013. Uh, go ahead and try and embed those videos into the, <clears throat> into the site so you can stream them. Otherwise, you'll have to download uh, to your PC. Um, this section here is for user notices, and we're trying to now keep track of the more, or keep some kind of a running history of the more significant user notices. If we have had a major outage, major system change, whatnot, so you don't have to keep track of all these these emails. Um, I like to try and keep these major posts, uh, major notices posted in this section. That way, uh, just for your reference, you can come back and look at at this stuff later, and you can see uh, the latest one we've had, which is the, the February 11th. 
change to the damage assessment toolkit uh, moving to the cloud. Um, at the bottom here, we've got uh, a link to some stuff we're starting to pull together for the teams. Uh, probably, you know, most of this isn't relevant. Stuff that's under this team site section isn't really relevant to users, um, but it's out there. And uh, at the very bottom here, there is a, a link to submit questions and feedback, and this is just going to link you back to the Storm Damage Project listserv, um, where you can send an email to uh, the group and everyone in uh, on the Damage Assessment Toolkit team, as well as all the users are registered to use this uh, this listserv. So that is a general overview of the site, some of the resources available to you on the site. So I'll mention the listserv one more time and emphasize how critical it is that everyone that's going to use this software program should be joining um, the listserv. The traffic thus far hasn't been too bad. Um, but, you know, if we make a change to something or have an outage or somebody experiences a, a problem or a bug, we're, we're communicating all this over the listserv. And if you're not on it, you're not going to hear about it. And uh, you may need to know, you know, if you're, you've got a survey that's, uh, that's up and coming and, and there's some kind of a system change that's planned or that's some kind of a bug that's occurred over a weekend, um, this is where all that information is flowing from and, and to. So please, uh, please join this listserv. This is going to save you a lot of hassles, a lot of headaches. Um, if it becomes too much traffic, you know, you can always, always mute the conversation or filter it out, filter it out with Google. But I highly encourage everyone to join this listserv. Um, also, I wanted to emphasize that uh, questions and comments through the listserv are definitely welcome. Um, there is a, a group of people that have been using this. Uh, the software for quite some time, and, and uh, there's a knowledge base out there. And so, if one of the developers isn't able to help you, there, you know, there's quite a lot of uh, other help out there available. Other people have been very helpful and very generous with their time and and uh, helping other users uh, troubleshoot. So, please submit any questions and comments you have to the listserv. And I just put this slide in here to uh, to document some of the same information that I showed you on the Google site. This is how you join the the listserv. I'll, uh, I'll leave this in the PowerPoint. You can uh, you can check this out later and, and sign up. And now I, I would like to talk about a, a help procedure that we have in place now. Um, if you do have problems, we're asking uh, we're asking everyone to go through and uh, check out the DAC Google site to make sure that your issue isn't related to some kind of an outage that we've posted. To make sure you've gone through the instructions and and use some of the available help resources on the on the Google site. And if you're still having trouble or, or you're stuck, um, the next uh, the next tier of help uh, we'd like people to utilize is to submit your issue to the local uh, ITO or ESA, whoever's in charge of uh, the systems in your office, and um, see if you can get help that way locally. And if you're still stuck, um, then you can go ahead and submit your your issue to the Storm Damage Listserv, to the email listserv. All the developers are on there, and if you if you can't get uh, a response via the listserv, you know, we'd, at, at the least one of the developers should respond. I would I would guess within uh, no later than a day or so. Um, you can contact the developers directly, and uh, all our names are listed on the, on the Google site if you have a specific question. So that is the current help procedure. Now we are uh, working on implementing a, a more robust help system that will have ticketing in the future. Um, I don't have a projected date yet as to when this will be implemented, but we are working out uh, an agreement with the talk, and they're going to assist with the ticketing. So the future help procedure will be to uh, go ahead and review the site, submit your issue locally, and uh, you can you can submit uh, a question to the, the damage storm damage listserv. If you don't get a a time, you know, you don't get something back in a satisfactory amount of time, or if it's an emergency at that point, you can submit uh, a ticket to the talk which will be uh, tracked and there will be a priority assigned and uh, somebody will get back to you once that, uh, once that ticket has been submitted. All the developers will be on that talk list and um, there will also be some uh, support provided from uh, our cloud hosting group, uh, which is an outside group that is maintaining the, the damage servers if the, uh, the issue happens to be related to uh, the, the cloud uh, server or the, or the software that's running on the cloud. So that is up and coming. 
Um, just one more time, I wanted to, to mention the login and the password that's required to get into the, uh, the Damage Assessment Toolkit Editor software and also the password that's required to transmit the data from the laptop app. I'm going to go ahead and type that into the chat so that everyone can see that once more. So the, um, the login ID is Dashians, and it's capital D, capital A, capital T, lowercase i, lowercase a, lowercase n, lowercase s. And the password is capital D, capital A, capital T, lowercase u, dollar sign, lowercase e, lowercase r, dollar sign. So that is the, the login and, and the password. Um, one thing that uh, we, w we do want to emphasize the, the DAT system, as far as entering the data goes, all the systems that are used to enter the data, we do want to make that secure. Um, so we want to emphasize that we don't want to give the software, the password, or any system access out to, um, to anybody outside the weather service. So the mobile application, the laptop application, and the DAT editor that we're going to demonstrate today, we want to emphasize that that we want to keep that protected, secure, internal only, and we don't want uh, folks outside the weather service using or entering data into that software. We are going to show you a link that you can provide to external partners and customers. It's going to be our, our DAT viewer. Um, basically, it's set up in a little bit different way so that data cannot be edited via the viewer. You can only view it. Um, that's a link that you can give out to your, your customers and partners. Um, but again, just want to emphasize we have to keep this internal at this point. So um, at this point in time, I'm going to turn over control of the webinar to Parks, and Parks is going to take us through a tour of the web editor. He's going to explain how it works and uh, show us how to enter data through it. All right. Thanks, Chris. Give me a second here. Okay. Okay, the webinar is yours. All right, let's see. Hopefully you all can see the screen there. Um, so what I'm going to do today is we're going to go through the web editor and all its functionality. And so this is, you know, um, how you go in and quality control the data and add data and delete data and uh, all, that, uh, all that kind of good stuff following your uh, surveys. So once again, just quickly as we went through yesterday, it's all kind of centered around getting the data into a geospatial database. Uh, and we went through the collection methods yesterday uh, with the, um, the laptop and the mobile applications. Today we're going to go through kind of the quality control part of it, um, as well as there's also, you know, you can also have a lot of uh, data entry capabilities um, with, the quality, with the web editor as well. And then there's the dissemination end, and we'll go through a little bit of that as well in terms of generating um, some products for, uh, for our users, uh, whether it be your websites or some of our other partners. All right, so the web editor, and I'm going to uh, highlight it in red, and it's very important to remember is that quality control is going to be extremely important to this. Um, until the data is quality controlled, it's not going to be um, it's not going to be available to the outside world. It's not going to be available on the public. Uh, web viewer or the public GIS services. So uh, once the data comes into from the field, it does need to be quality controlled, and, and I'll show you how to do that here shortly. So with the web editor, we've got quality control and we've got data editing. We can uh, input data, and that's points and polygons and also paths. So um, we can also add uh, geotagged photos, and we've got there's a couple ways of doing that. So you can add uh, add photos to your data as well. Uh, that way, we've got data extraction, so we've got a couple formats we can extract the data. Uh, you can do some basic analysis on it. Uh, something we're looking at into, uh, into the future is actually being able to kind of generate a PNS uh, formatted, uh, formatted PNS uh, type of output from, uh, from the web editor uh, to make uh, PNS generation easier for you after following events. 
All right, so in terms of, uh, I'm going to say it again, quality control is extremely important. Uh, like I said, the quality control data is the only data that's going to be available to our outside users. So if we want them to see it, uh, we need to make sure we uh, do that. Uh, the reason we've got that step in there is just, you know, even we just want a second, basically a second pair of eyes to see the data as it comes in from the field before it goes out. All right, and so when I'm talking about our outside users, this is a little bit of, of who I'm talking about. Um, we've got a lot of interest actually from the state and federal level in emergency management, so FEMA and the state emergency management uh, from a couple different states. They're very interested in seeing the, the storm damage uh, survey data as quickly as possible so they can allocate resources, um, so they know where some of the worst of the damage is. Um, and so this, uh, this allows them to do that when they can see the data uh, kind of coming in, not in real time, but uh, you know, faster than um, maybe waiting on a, a you know, PNS at the very end of the day or, or something like that. So uh, we've also had some interest from the insurance industry. Um, they're interested in a lot for the same reasons. They want to allocate their resources most effectively, so it helps them to, uh, to know where some of the worst of the damage is and some of the hard-hit areas are. Uh, interest from the media, certainly, and uh, seeing the results of uh, storm surveys, the public, and also the scientific community. Uh, you know, the idea is this for to be a, um, you know, a historic database for uh, damage surveys. Uh, I know the EF, um, the folks that uh, have developed the EF scale are interested in this data um, in terms of um, gathering a database of, of data for the EF scale and, and finding ways to enhance the EF scale. All right, so some of the capabilities here, um, we've got the capabilities to add, delete, edit, uh, any of the types of data we have in the um, in their points, paths, or polygons. Uh, we can export uh, in a shape file or a KML, uh, and also you can uh, take a pretty easy screenshot um, as well if you just want a static image. We also import geotag photos, and then we can also have the capability to geolocate photos if you have uh, GPS track information. And then I threw in quality control just to remind everybody one more time. All right, so here are the uh, web addresses once again for the, uh, the various interfaces. Uh, we've got the operational one at, at the top. Uh, for, and we've got the test, test web editor as well. Please use that if you're just uh, you're trying to get familiar, familiar with the interface and you're trying to test out some things or, or demonstrate some things, please use that for that purpose. Um, and if you've got any kind of experimental purposes you want to try to use things, uh, please do it with the, uh, with the test interface. And then there's the damage viewer, which is our kind of public facing uh, services there. So and that's only going to show the QC data. And I will mention too, I know the, the IP addresses in there, that's pretty ugly. We are working to get um, um, some prettier uh, DNS names uh, attached to these. So uh, we'll let you know when we do. Uh, it's quite a bit of work to go through to get that done. All right, so with that, I'll bring up our website. Thanks. Okay. Uh, what I've got up here now, this is the, uh, the test web editor. Um, and so I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and refresh to show uh, what it looks like when it comes up. Okay, so what you're going to see, you're going to see your warning message there as you're connecting to the government computer. And then you're going to see a uh, username and password window pop up. You're going to put in the username and password that, that's uh, provided for the, for the project. Click OK, and then that's going to allow it to pull up the, the layers. So uh, without the username and password, you'd see the map there, but you wouldn't see any, any data ever, ever come up on the map, and you wouldn't be able to use, uh, use any of the tools. So to know you're on the test database, it's, it's marked in a couple places on the website up there at the top where it says test data, and also um, an image down here near the bottom right-hand right, uh, right -hand corner that uh, also tells you test data as well. Uh, so this is interface, and I'll go through um, some of the navigation, uh, navigational tools with it. Uh, to, to, uh, you can drag the map around. Uh, you can just click on the map and drag it around, do whatever you need to do. It's going to perform a lot like a Google map or or Google Earth or some kind of interface, any kind of those interfaces like that. Um, you can go over here. Also, when you first log in the first time, it's going to ask you to choose an office ID. Uh, so if you choose your local office ID for that, that'll make sure that uh, you're zoomed into your area every time you go to the page. Uh, in addition, when you create, uh, 
create data through the interface. It'll make sure that your office ID gets attached to those points. And then finally, uh, when you're signed in, so if I'm signed in right now as Tallahassee, I can't go in and edit Jacksonville's data or, or Birmingham's data or anything like that. I won't have that capability. And also we ask that you don't, uh, don't attempt to edit any uh, data that's outside of your area. All right, so um, over here, if you zoom in, you can also do a shift and a drag and, and uh, uh, zoom in on a square. If you go over here to the left-hand side, there's a couple buttons here. The globe here will take you out to the back to your full extent of, uh, of your office that, you're, that you've got uh, written in there. You've got the slider bar here. You can zoom in and out. So this is all pretty, uh, pretty easy, pretty, pretty standard type stuff. So you've got some uh, zoom in and zoom out uh, buttons there that you can work with there. Uh, so that's that's fairly standard. So up on the uh, on the right over here, let's see, let's zoom back out. See all our data there. Uh, if you go to the slide over the more uh, button there, you'll see the layer names that pop up. So you've got your damage uh, your damage data there, and you can turn any of that on and off uh, that you want by just by clicking the buttons on and off there. So um, and that'll take those. Different, different things on and off. It's got a CWA background map over there, and it's actually a bit modified, so it extends over all the coastal waters uh, as well, but you can certainly turn that on or off as well if you want. Uh, the next button over here doesn't really have a name, but what it does is it gives you a variety of different uh, background-based maps for you to look at um, if you want um, to see background image, imagery. You can do that um, and then zoom in. So this is going to be a you know Google map, Google Earth type. Uh, type image here uh, as we zoom in. Get better and better detail there. And there's several other base maps there depending on uh, what's most pleasing uh, pleasing to your eye. So uh, certainly, certainly your choice. Uh, the top bar up here, if you do need to change the office ID for any reason, you can click on, uh, click on the office name there and then pull up the list there that's got the list of all the office IDs. Um, and so I'm going to Make sure I go back to Tallahassee for purposes here. Back to Tallahassee, but you can choose yours. And once you choose it, it'll zoom in uh, to your, your area. And it also stays zoomed into that area when you return to the site later. Okay. Uh, so also up here, we have a date filter up here. And this is extremely useful, especially as the database is, is gathering more and more data. Uh, what this does, it sorts the data based on the storm date field, so what, whatever date you, the data has for uh, the date of the storm occurred, and it'll filter it on that. So um, most of this day, test data here has just been in the last couple days, but if I, so if I go back to uh, and just look into January here as a beginning and end date, so the 1st and 31st, and filter uh, should take away all that data there, so it doesn't have any data for that, for that period. So I come back here and... Come back and filter back to February, hit filter, and it should pop back up. Uh, you can also turn the date filter just off completely if you want to see uh, all the data that's in the database, and you can do that. You see some other uh, other information that's popped up there. So we'll go back and uh, put that back on our current date there and get rid of some of that extraneous stuff. All right, the other thing here, too, that can be pretty useful is um, to check on and off of the QC to non-QC data. So if I click on uh, non-QC, this will show me, uh, click off that. So all I'm looking at now is the data that's been quality controlled. Uh, so this would be the data that would be available on the, on the outward facing site. Um, click that back on both and then I can turn off that and uh, turn off the quality control data. And this can be useful if you're going through and quality controlling data. So as you quality control it, if you have the quality control data turned off as you quality control it, it'll disappear from your view so you know exactly what other points you have to have to go in and take care of without having to, to select through each one of them. All right. So that's uh, kind of the navigational features uh, of, the, of the interface. Now what we'll do, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, now what we'll do, we'll go through some of the uh, go through all the features and, and how you can go in and add data and, and look at data and that kind of thing. So uh, the first toolbox up here that you can open is called the Identify and Edit Toolbox. And um, it's a little pencil up there. 
and it does pretty much what it says. You can use it to identify uh, data and also to edit data. So I'm going to open that up, and that'll pull up this window here. And you can drag this window around, so if it's somewhere inconvenient and you want to move it around, you can certainly uh, do that without, uh, without any issues. Uh, so the first, um, the highlighted dot here, it's going to kind of default to be the highlighted one here, and that's the select tool there. So when that's selected here, you can click on the map on any of your data, and then it will, um, once you click on it, it'll load up what that data is uh, and pull up a little summary of what, what's in that data point. So here, this was an EF4, wind speed 200 miles an hour, gives you the location, gives you the time of the, of the damage, so the time of the storm, and then gives you the time when it was surveyed, gives you the damage indicators and the degree of the damage and whether or not it was quality, it's been quality controlled, <coughs> and any comments that are in, the, in it. So um, you've got that. Um, you can do that. If you, if you select on an area that's got uh, multiple things here, so there's a couple things on top of each other down here. It'll pull up the whole list of uh, kind of around that point where you clicked, and it'll pull up uh, the points that are in there. It'll pull up the um, damage path that is in there, so that will have the image from, uh, uh, or, excuse me, all the data from that damage image, and we'll go through what what data is contained in that here shortly. Uh, the polygons, if you draw any polygons, and there's a couple polygons there, an EF1 polygon, an EF3 polygon. Um, so you, that that can uh, you can see all that now. If you've got uh, let's see, find one with it's got a picture attached to it. Should pop up there. Okay, so that point there, that's actually one of the uh, uh, that's a picture that's been uploaded through the interface, and you can, that'll show up as a little thumbnail beside the point when you click on it. Um, if you hover over that picture, it'll pull up a, a pop up there with the picture in it. And then you can click on that picture, and it'll open up the full image um, in another uh, another tab or another another window, uh, however, however you're set up. So you can see the full size image there, and uh, take a look at it there if you need to reassess things or just want to look at it and, and see what it looks like. So that's how you go about um, identifying, uh, looking at the looking at your data um, with kind of a quick overview. If you want to clear this window out, you just hit the little trash can here, and it'll take you back. Uh, straight to this uh, kind of main menu of this box. All right, so the next thing you can do after you've identified your data here, so we'll go back and click on uh, back on this point here. So I've got that point there. Let's say I want to make some changes to that point. If I click on it and I've uh, selected the correct office of who it belongs to, it will zoom in for me onto the point. So it'll zoom right down down to the point, and I'll have a little eye info over it over it there. And then what you'll see pop up is the form where you can go in and look at all the data and edit any of the data that you want to edit. Excuse me a second. All right, so everything that's in the database that you can that you can control um, is available to you in this box for damage point. There's a separate form. For a point, and for a path, and for a for a polygon. So we'll go through uh, we'll go through all of those. So if I want to edit this data that's already in there, I can I can do that. I can change the, the storm date if I want. I can make it uh, uh, the next day. And if I have a, a better time for it uh, that I want to put, I can put that in there. Uh, the survey date I can change that uh, pretty easily there. If I need to change the uh, the damage indicator, I can do that. So all your damage indicators are here. Can change it to uh, something different, and once you choose that, it's going to change your degree of damage to the appropriate selections there. So you can go through that and pick your uh, degree of damage. And then, just like the applications we saw yesterday, the wind speed here is tied to your um, is tied to your damage indicator and degree of damage with the, the minimum and maximum expected speeds, and it'll always default to the expected value, which is from the the EF scale documentation. So you can slide that up and down uh, however you need to there. And as you do that, you'll notice again the EF rating will change along with you if you need to. Uh, if it's not tornado damage, you can always go down and pick uh, thunderstorm wind damage. Uh, you can do that. And then if we put it back on the EF scale, then it'll be back to it'll change uh, back to how we want it. 
All right, so if you're the same thing, if you've got a damage direction that you want to put in, you can, you can put that in, injuries and fatalities, uh, and comments, same as uh, you've seen before. So then we could, uh, once we've done editing, we can submit that edit, say OK, and it's going to say point updated. Now, if the, that, that point happened to be in the test database here, I already had the quality control flag checked to yes, so it didn't ask me to do that. If you haven't quality control it and you go to submit an edit, it will ask you when you do it if you're ready to quality control that data, and you can choose yes or no. Now, if we go back and select that point one more time, all right, here we go. We should see, so our damage indicator was changed. Now it's manufactured home, double wide, and so that information has, uh, has changed. Let's say we want to, um, while we're here, we're going to attach a picture to this. There was a little selection down here um, that says attach image. So if I, I've got a picture that I know was taken, maybe given this to us by the EM or something like that, that was taken to this location we want to attach, we can do that. You click attach. Uh, you're going to go pick your uh, picture that you want here out of your file system. It's going to load that up, and then you can submit the edit again, and it's going to upload that. It's going to give you a couple little windows to uh, to force you to click to, to upload stuff. That's a kind of a security thing with uh, with Flash. So, but anyway, so that's all been added now, and you'll get status windows there. And if we go click on that again. All right, now our picture that we just uploaded is right there. And we can click on that then and see the full size picture. So now we've got the picture attached to that, uh, to that point. All right, so that's, um, that's editing the, uh, the points. Now let's see, let me zoom back out. If I've got some path information in there, or actually what we'll do here first, we'll go ahead and do an add point, and then we'll add the other, <coughs> excuse me, add the other stuff as well. All right, so let's see. All right, there's our stuff there. All right, so what I'm going to do here is, um, well, let's go. We'll, we'll continue to kind of go along the path we're going. So we've got some paths and some polygons that have been entered in, into the database here. If I want to edit those, I can do that the same way. So I'm going to start with that same select button there and say I'm going to select the uh, this path here. So the paths are just line, line segments, basically. All right. And we kind of envision these as being really useful in helping to create your, uh, your PNSs. We've got kind of all the information that you need for a PNS or for storm data uh, built into these. All right. So here we go. We've got uh, our damage path information here. We've got a start date and an end date with the with the time on it. We've got the EF rating for that path. We've got the maximum wind speed we can put in there. Uh, the length is calculated automatically when you draw the line, so it's it's the length of the line uh, that you've drawn. And the width you put in there manually, and it's in yards, so we can change that if we want. Um, and then we can submit that edit. And now that path's been updated with that information. So. Now let's think. Uh, let's just see. Let's. We want. We don't quite like the way that's shaped. We need to change the shape of the line. We can do that as well. Uh, so if you go down here to the bottom, it says Edit Path. If you click on that, you're going to see some vertices pop up on uh, on your line segment there. And then with those, you can adjust them however you want. Uh, should be able to. Let's see here. Yeah, you can hover over the line and create an additional line segment like that. Uh, change the endpoint, do whatever you want to do to make it a uh, more representative path. Then once you're done with that, you double click just anywhere on the background, and it's going to move the path for you. And so now it's been uh, now it's been moved uh, to the new location that you set there. All right. So let's see. Next, we'll go and look at um, the polygons here. So we've got a couple of polygons up here. Uh, the way they're set up right now. Um, is they're layered such that uh, EF0 is at the bottom and EF5 is, uh, is on top. So we can click on, uh, click on those features there, and we can go in and edit those basically in the same way. Uh, the one that's uh, turns blue or black there is going to be the, the highlighted one, so we're going to go in. So this is our EF1. I guess the one, me, the one in black is the, the, the one we've selected.
selected. So that's EF2, uh, excuse me, EF1. We can change that, say that's EF0. Uh, once again, we've got injuries, fatalities, and the link. Because they're polygons, it's hard to, it's really kind of a, a difficult task to automatically uh, determine length and, and width. So uh, we haven't done anything automatic like that in this, uh, in this case, but you can add that data. And then the same way as before, you can edit the polygon here. It'll bring up those vertices for you so you can adjust it, add more vertices if you need to, uh, whatever you need to do to change that, and then double click on the background map. And then that should move that polygon and update the color for you as well indicating we've changed it to ES0. So if we can pick this other one here, let's say we want to make that um, EF5. Uh, we can do that as well. We can submit that, and it'll update the polygon on the server there, so that's an EF5 polygon there. So that's how you go in and, and edit any of the data that you've got in there. So uh, let's say you want to, uh, you want to add, add new data, and that's what these next three icons are here. So the dot with the plus sign is to add a point. You can hover over them and it'll tell you what they do. Uh, the polygon with the plus sign is to add the polygons. And the plus sign with the line segment is to add the path. So it should be pretty, uh, pretty self-explanatory. So if you want to add a point, you just click on the Add Point button and then click on, the, uh, click on the map where you want to do it. Now you notice on the bottom left down there, there is a latitude and longitude readout. So if you need to find a particular point, you can uh, engage it with that. And basically, you'll just click on the point uh, where you want to add add the point, and then it will pull up the form one more time uh, for the point. So you can enter all the data that you need to for the point. So we can change the date if we need to. We can change the time. Times are all going to be in UTC. Uh, we can change the uh, make sure we pick our damage indicator and degree of damage, adjust our wind speed however we need to do that add any comments in here that we want, and then slide down, buttons are kind of hidden out here. If we want to attach an image like this before, we can do that, and then we're ready to add that point, you just click add the point, and here's the window I was talking about earlier. If you're ready to quality control the data, you can. If you're not yet, then you just say no, and it, and it won't quality control, and then it'll tell you it's added the point, and you should be good to go. We can go back to select that point and identify it, and there it is. That's what we've uh, just put into the database. All right, so similar uh, methodology for the other two here. So if we want to add a polygon, what we're going to do, we're going to click on there, and we're going to click on the map to start drawing, and then click on the map for each of your vertices. And then when you're done, you're going to double-click at your last spot, and then that'll create the polygon there, and it'll bring up your uh, form here for your polygons. And you can choose, uh, choose the information that you want to there for the polygons. Say five there and 300 yards there and we'll add the polygon. We won't quality control that one either and then we'll add it and it should pop up there for you. All right, so that's the polygons and then the paths, the same kind of thing. Click on that path button there, it should light up. Uh, then you're gonna click where you wanna start drawing and then Click for each of your vertices and double click when you're done. And then that'll take you to the form. And then you can fill out the form. Like I said, it calculates the length of the line you just drew there and it'll put that in for you. It'll also give you your start points and end points and latitude and longitude for you. Uh, so when you're ready to do that, you add the path there. And then the quality control, we won't do that uh, now either. And there you go. And so now we've got a path that's uh, been added in there. Excuse me, got a little cough today. All right, so that's uh, basically how you add data and do some editing, editing to the data. Now, the common scenario is you've got uh, you've done a survey. Say you did the survey in Hattiesburg uh, uh, on Monday after the EF420, and you've got a whole group of data that you want um, that you want to quality control, and you want to click that onto yes. But it's, you've got you know, 40 or 50 points, and you really don't want to go through and, and do those each uh, individually and do them manually. So what you can do here, we've got this batch select tool here. So if you click on that, then you go to your map, and you click, and you're going to draw a box around all the data that, you're trying, that you want to deal with, and double-click at the end. 
And so that's going to pull up all the all that data that you just selected in a big list here. And it's a little different from what we saw before because there's a couple other options up here at the top. There's a QC selected, a delete selected, um, and a clear if you just want to clear everything, clear your check marks. So and then there are check boxes here uh, beside each of the each of the data points that we pulled up. So what we can do, see these first two have already been quality control. Their quality control flag is yes. So let's say we want to go ahead and we want to quality control the rest of this. So we can go through and we can click on uh, the check marks for the points that haven't been quality controlled yet. And if they have, and it's not going to make a difference if you check it and it already has. All right, we'll click on the polygon there. So we've got the ones checked that we want checked. And then we go hit uh, QC selected. And it's going to ask you, are you sure? And you say yes. And there we go. And now our data is in quality controlled. And we can confirm that. We can turn off the, uh, the non-quality control button there. And all the data stays, stays up. So now we know it's been quality controlled. All right. So that's how you can quality control it. If there's data that you want to delete, there's a bunch of data that you, just, you don't want in there, you want to get rid of it, uh, you can do the same thing. So you, you pick that batch select tool. Uh, draw a circle, draw your around what you want to get rid of. So we'll get rid of these couple polygons here. Uh oh, that's not good. I'll try that again. Right, we'll just delete the point here first and then I'll have to check on that other error later. So there's our data there. Let's say we want to, uh, we'll just delete this first one here, get rid of that one, and we can say delete selected. And are you sure? And it should give me a, uh, Refresh my page here, see if that clears that up. Apologize for that. Reload things here briefly. Here we go. If my connection got a little hung up there. This guy here, we'll just go with uh, delete selected. Are you sure? Yep. And that will take care of that for you and it'll disappear off the map for you. So there's your uh, way you can quality control and delete kind of large amounts of data at once if you need to. All right, so that pretty much covers the identify and edit toolbox. Uh, next thing we're going to cover here is our, what's called the photo match toolbox. And what this is allows you to do is um, if you've got photos that are geotagged, say with a phone or something like that, they're photos that came off a phone that are already geotagged or a GPS-enabled camera, anything like that, uh, you can use this tool uh, to load those into the database. Uh, you can also, if you've got, um, if you've got uh, aren't as many around now, but a handheld GPS or GPS in the car that creates a track file and you're taking pictures with just a regular digital camera, um, this tool also allow you to take those two pieces of information, your track file, which is in a GPX format, and your photos, as long as they've got their, you know, the time attached to them, and you can match those up with time and interpolate the locations there. So this tool will allow you to do that. Uh, so I'll show you a couple examples of that. All right, first thing we're going to do here is uh, 
load the photos we want to load. And I've got a couple samples here. Um, so you, just, you can pick multiple photos. So you just do a shift to collect to select more than one. And then what it's going to do is it's going to look at the look at the photos when you load them in and determine whether or not they're geotagged or not. So whether they've got that information embedded in them. Uh, these do. So uh, these couple images do. So that's what we're going to say okay. And then everything else disappears. You don't have to worry about any of that other stuff on, that was on the form. And you're just going to go to step two, which is to process the photos. So it's going to upload the photos, and then it's going to submit a job to the server, and it's just going to keep you, give you a status here. Um, kind of runs in the background, and then should tell you when it's done. And those points are going to be added to the database. If I move the map a little bit, they should pop up right there. So you should be see the red dot. Uh, uh, right there that popped up. So those are going to be the points that, that were added there um, along with the, the pictures that, that we had. So uh, that's for a geotagged, uh, that's for the geotagged photos there. Now if you go to uh, load some photos and let's say you pick, I'm going to pick these other two here, and these are not geotagged. So these are don't, don't have the location information already embedded in them. So you'll notice that. It just says images loaded and zipped and it'll <coughs> zip everything up for you. So now if we've got our GPX file here, got one right there, and it says GPX loaded. So now what you can do, um, it's going to depend on time zone and how, you're, how close the, the time on your camera matches the time on your GPS. So uh, you kind of need to have an idea of those two pieces of information. But you can choose the offset, and generally it's going to be your time zone offset, offset. So right now here in Eastern time zone, it's, it's five hours. So uh, we'll set it for that and then hit geotag. And that's going to pop up um, uh, pop up a little pin over here, and that's telling you where it says the, the pictures are. So we can zoom in there. All right, so there's a couple couple points points there. I can actually can open that up there, and it's going to zoom back and forth to the various pictures. Now, if they're not in the right location, you can make adjustments here. So uh, with the time to kind of see if you can get them in, in the right location. So I uh, did that, and I didn't like that. So we'll go back to where we were, and there it comes back to, I know those are in the, in the right place. So once you've got them geotagged, uh, and you've got them in the, in the, the icons and in in where you want them to be, where in the, in the correct location, go through the other uh, three steps here. So you can upload the photos, and it's going to zip all those photos up and ship them up to the server. Do the same thing with the GPS file. And you're going to process those photos, and same thing. It's going to keep you kind of abreast of uh, uh, the status of your thing there. Let's see. This. Occasionally, it will fail. We can uh, do this one more time. Go through those steps one more time. Upload our photos. There we go. All right. So if you do have any trouble with this tool, um, let me know, and then we'll try to work out if it's uh, some sort of bug or if it's just a, a database issue. So if I move the map a little bit, it should refresh. All right. So there are those points there that I just added. Um, they'll have these pictures attached. So that's the photo, photo match toolbox there. So that's uh, another way you can get, get that data into, into the database. And then you can go in and edit that data um, once, once it's in there. So uh, what you kind of want to do here, we'll click on this and uh, see if we got everything in there. There we go. All right, so there's our pictures there. Um, 
and you can go in as before. Now, when you when you put stuff in this way, it's not it's going to default to really have no information other than the survey date, which is going to be basically the time of the picture, and then the software just is going to assume that the damage date was the same date. So you probably need to go in and modify that on on the pictures when you upload them. Uh, and you can do that the same way that we showed before. So I won't go all the way through that since we're running a little long on time here. All right, so that's how you can get the, the photos into the server there. All right, so the final, uh, well, let's see, I'll show you a couple more things here. The, the other main, main thing to show you is the extraction toolbox. So let me zoom back here. And this is how you can extract the data. And get it... Uh, get it out of the database in a couple different ways. So this is the Extract Toolbox. And uh, a couple of things here, uh, you have a choice of a KML or a shapefile. And you've got a couple other choices here. You can get all the points, polygons, and paths, or just, just the points, or just the polygons, or any combination of that. Um, with the web editor, you can choose to get just the QC data, or you can get all the data that, that you select. So you, can, you have that option as well. Um, and then you can... Uh, Probably what you'll, what you'll do most of the time is have this uh, use date range from the main banner selected, and that'll use this date filter that you've got selected up here when it goes to goes to select the points. Uh, if you click on this little gear button here, this will uh, choose the parameters that will go into uh, the KML. So the shape file actually ends up with all the fields in it, but the uh, the KML you can you can choose which uh, fields you want to include in that. So uh, you can click on those check marks there, and then click on the I button to get back to the uh, main main thing here. Uh, so as you've kind of seen before, to so where you want you're going to want to select an area of the data. So we'll go and grab this area here. You're going to draw a box around it and double click when you're done. Once you do that, it's going to submit that job to the server and give you a status there. Take a couple seconds to do. All right, that succeeded, and then it's going to give you a, a link to click on. So in this case, I just chose KML. So I can click on that KML link, and that's going to pop down, download for me. And then I can go and uh, open that up in Google Earth. There it is. All right. So I've just opened this up now in Google Earth, and here's all the data that, uh, that I extracted. So I can click on it and get the information that I need. If there were pictures attached to these, let's see if this one's got the picture on it. Yeah, it does. Uh, if there's pictures attached to it, it'll basically have an embedded link to the picture on the on the server. So. Uh, we can click on that and open up the full size image. We've got connected to that, and we can see the um, the various information that we've got for the polygons or the paths or the points or anything like that. So you can take this KML then, and you can basically do what do what you want with it. If you want to put it on your web page or uh, office web page or that kind of thing, so that's. That's the primary use of that, or, to, or you know, pass it out to partners that you've got, or anything that you need to do like that. So that's the extraction, and uh, let's see, go back here. If we did, uh, let's see if we did the same thing, and we did the shape file. Basically, going to do the same thing, and it's going to generate a set of shape files for you, and they're going to be in a zip file when it when it comes back to you. So you can take those, take the shape file there, and you can uh, plug that into ArcGIS. Um, if you want to do some uh, work with it in ArcGIS. So that's kind of the extraction capabilities you have there. So we'll let that finish and then... All right, so there you go. So now if you've got both selected, it's going to give you a KML link there and then a shapefile link there, and so you can click on that um, as well. All right, so that's uh, pretty much the extraction toolbox. And so that's all the, the, big, uh, the big tools that are included here. There's a couple other... Uh, tools up here as well, I'll go over pretty quick. Uh, there's a measure toolbox, and here you can go in and, and do your measuring. So if you need to measure a path width or uh, anything like that, you can do that. So you click on the line there, you can uh, pick pick what units you want to do, um, and then the same as for click to start drawing and double click to complete. Oh, let's see. All right, there we go, and it, then it will uh, should pop up. Uh, 
yep, there you go. It pops up and shows you the your start location and end location and your path link for, for the line segment you created. So uh, you can do that. And if you want just a, a screenshot, and you and the, what the screenshot will do is it will take all the kind of the background gunk away uh, and give you a nice clean uh, uh, image. So you can do that. You can export the JPEG there um, and then decide where you want to do it. I've already got one, so that's fine. All right, and so now I've got a JPEG. Let's see where that went there. Open that up, and so there's the JPEG that I just picked. Like I said, it takes away all the uh, the outside stuff there. All right, so that's um, that's the quick and dirty on the uh, basically on the the whole thing there. Now, if you go to the viewer, so if you've got people asking about the viewer, we can go to that real quick. So I don't I don't have a viewer set up just for the the test data. So this is the viewer for the operational um, stuff here, and so we can uh, slide over here to um, uh, to Mobile and Jackson's area where they had the tornadoes the other day, and see the information that they've got. So this is all data that's been quality controlled um, and is available out to the to the public um, to see. And so the interface is pretty much the same. You've got this identify toolbox. The main difference is it doesn't have the edit capability, so we can go and we can uh, click on the points here. And let's see what we got here, if we've got any pictures that we've got with those. Let's see if we can find one with a picture with it. There we go. There's some of the pictures from uh, the surveys out there that you can go and look at. And then the capabilities here as well, it's got the same extraction toolbox here where you can extract a KML. This will only extract uh, quality control data. Uh, from the database. It won't uh, get any non-quality control data, data in there. All right. So that um, pretty much concludes the, the demo part here. Let's see where we were on this, and I think that's pretty much it. So we're kind of ready to go with uh, questions here. So we'll go take a look at uh, some of the questions here. Let's see. Parks, I've tried to answer some of these already, so you might uncheck okay. that box that says show answered questions. Okay. There we go. All right. We did okay, have yeah, one sorry, that came in about the, uh, the laptop application that I'd just like to follow up on. Um, someone asked if we could install the laptop application on a personally owned laptop. That's something we're going to have to check into. I'm not sure what the restrictions are uh, on that. But we'll check into that and get back to the list. Uh, let's see. Um, is there a built-in mechanism to prevent higher EF scale polygons from being outside the lower EF scale polygon? No, there's nothing built in uh, built in to do that. So that's kind of a um, a user thing. We'll have to kind of be aware of that. Uh, let's see. How do we generate web pages for that? That's we're kind of leaving up to your local local office because there's there's so many. Uh, every office kind of has a different way that they like to generate their storm damage websites. But there are lots. There are a lot of there's several easy ways. I know to embed a KML onto a Google map um, in the websites, and um, I'm not really a web uh, web developer guy, so in terms of the uh, doing that, so I'm going to leave that up to um, maybe some other people to uh, uh, to give advice on that. But there there are several different ways that that you can do that and get these uh, get the basically embed the KML onto onto the web page. Uh, we had we had tried a little little experiment last year with uh, trying to automatically generate the web page, um, but it there's so many variables and really every office tends to do it kind of their own way. Um, that's I'm not sure how useful useful that was going to be. So let's see here. Uh, you can import to a KML file, but there is there any way to you can export to a KML file, but is there any way to import from KML? Uh, no, there's not at this time. It's something we can we can look at in the future. The you know the issue with with importing other data like that is we have to make sure that it um, matches basically a certain format. Um, so we you know otherwise we're uh, it's hard to make things uh, gen completely generic for every type type of data that we might import. So uh, there's something we could consider. It has to be kind of thought out pretty pretty carefully. Let's see. 
Uh, in the read-only partner version, can they create their own KML and shape files? Yes, they can. They can do that. Uh, so if you want to publish a weather story about a severe weather outbreak, are we forced to use the KML option? Drop that into Google Maps to have a map show the public that they can query. Uh, that's probably the easiest way. Um, I mean, there, there might be ways that you could um, uh, embed the, the GIS service that points to the, to, the, to the public data into a web page, but I don't, know how, uh, I don't know how easy that would be to do kind of in a, in a quick way. So I think the KML option is, uh, is probably the best option, but that's, that's something that you can explore you know, as users in the field. There's also the JPEG option. Right, and you can, yeah, or you can extract a JPEG and, and post a JPEG. Um, let's see. So in addition to the recordings, can these two webinars be repeated again? Uh, we've, um, we've talked about that. We are we're pondering that. If, um, the problem is we're getting into, uh, starting to get into severe weather season, which, make, which makes setting up the webinars in a um, Clear weather time and then ahead enough time, pretty difficult. But we are exploring that. We'll let you know if we're if we're able to uh, to do that. But we'll definitely have them recorded. Let's see. All right. Uh, I've got this about. Um, let's see. Where the maps can be manipulated and only uh, only each point would show the photos we've we've taken. Uh, let's see. I don't uh, have that that link up for that question that was was asked, but if you embed a KML into a Google map on your website, you can go and click on that KML and it will pop up the, the images that are associated with that. I'm not sure if that answers the question uh, exactly or not. Uh, let's see if, if, Again, if it doesn't. Again, we also have phone, REST services uh, that, that give people a lot of different options for feeding the stream of data into a website. Um, that's something we really should look into exploring and seeing. Um, you know what kinds of uh, features added that we can uh, we can build into kind of a default website template. Because I think there's a lot of potential to use those GIS services for uh, for showing these damage impact areas. Right. Yeah. It's something we, we just we haven't fleshed out completely yet. So we'll be certainly open to any ideas that any anyone has. Uh, how do the customers get the KML file? Well, if if it's extracted from if if you as an office have extracted it, you can email it to them or, or put it on your website or that kind of thing. Uh, customers that go to the public uh, viewer, they can get their own KML. They can create their own KML um, and get it that way. So there are a couple different options there. Uh, let's see. Is the current edit tool for QE? Let's see. Okay, so it looks like we're maybe missing some, uh, missing some degrees on our, our direction. Yeah, we can fix that. I'll mark that down here. That'll be an easy fix. Thanks for that. <laughs> okay. Uh, has the team identified a good method to obtain georeference pictures and information from non-NWS individuals such as EMs? I didn't think email would attach georeferences. Um, actually, I, I haven't had a trouble. I've taken pictures on my iPhone and emailed them to myself, and that's actually what I did when I when I uh, put those pictures in there. Those were geotags that the images that I'd taken on my phone and emailed to myself, and was and when I loaded those, they had the geotag references in there. So. Um, I think probably email is probably probably okay to do in terms of getting uh, getting the pictures and information from from your outside partners. All right, and there's one other thing. Yeah, okay, so that's just another uh, direction we're missing. We'll take care of those in the in the interface. So let's see. Here's a couple more coming in. Okay, how would you insert a picture that has no GPS attributes? Well. You need, to lo you need to know the location, certainly, whether they told you what it was or anything like that. Uh, once you find that location, let me see, let me go back to the interface here. And basically, you would, to do that, you're going to, uh, let's see, let me go back to the, basically, you're going to enter a point into the database. And when you enter the point, that's not what I wanted either. Try that. All right, so basically, if you want to get a picture that doesn't have any GPS information in it, uh, you're going to basically want to, you, you'll need to know where the picture is, find the location on the map, 
and then basically add a point there. And I'll just show you very briefly. Click the add point. When you go to add that point, uh, you can attach the image there. So you can fill out your information there and attach the image here with the attach image button, and you can you can do it that way. Uh, rotating the pictures that are inadvertently taken, uh, yeah, it's something we can look into. I'm going to have to uh, work on work on that a little bit, but I understand that could be could be an issue. So what the question was is, would it be possible to add a feature to rotate pictures that were inadvertently taken with the wrong orientation uh, with the DAT? So that's something we, uh, we we'll, we'll try to look into and and uh, get fixed, or you have a way for it to be fixed. All right, so I think I'm at the end of the list there. Oh, here's one more. All right. Uh, what are the options for WFOs that don't have wireless capability from the field? Well, what you're basically going to do there, if you don't have any kind of capability to send from the field, you're going to have to basically collect the points with the, with the laptop application. Bring, when you get back to the office with the laptop, hook the laptop back up to your network and sync them, sync them then. That's going to be your option there. Um, to get stuff in from the field. Okay, storm data, the official record, still only allows a path to consist of two points in a straight line path. As the inherent discrepancies that will occur between the DAT program and storm data been addressed? Uh, no, we are we are in contact with the storm data folks to try to see to make sure we can we can uh, uh, get these two applications uh, together. But no, that's that's uh, that hasn't been addressed yet. So that's a good question. Okay, this is a good question too. There were a couple of DIs for grain bins and silos that were in the previous DAT, um, and we have removed them. There's the reason for this is uh, those were some kind of experimental uh, DIs that were developed, um, I believe, by the uh, I believe it was the Omaha office. I'm not not positive on that. Um, they haven't been accepted officially as as uh, DIs in the EF scale. So in order to keep everything scientifically matching with the with the um, with the literature and keep everything, everything consistent, uh, we've taken those out and we just have strictly the DIs that are included in the official EF EF scale. Uh, so what we will do is, if new DIs are approved and officially used in the scale, we will uh, we will add those to the to the interface at that time. All right. So Chris, I think that's got down to the bottom of the list. So if we want to open it up for a few minutes, we can we can do that. Okay, I'm going to hit the button here and see if this works. The leader has turned lecture off, and your lines have okay, been unmuted. The, uh, lecture mode should be to off unmute now, your so, line, uh, press star six or pound six. Hey, uh, this is Kurt from uh, Huntsville. Uh, I know you touched on a little bit already uh, with adding a particular lat lawn, but it seems from what you said the only way you can do it is by zooming and moving around the map, not necessarily entering in a specific lat lawn that might have come in after the survey or, or from an EMA where you know the exact lat lawn already, uh, but you don't want to try to zoom around and pan around to find it on the map. Yeah, that's something that, that's, that's a feature request we can look at adding. So we don't have that capability now, but we, that's something we can look, look to add. Cool. Appreciate it. I got one other question. Um, sure. On when you're in there in the in the editor, can you see other forecast areas points? Let's say if you had a tornado that you're trying to make sure matches yes. up on the polygons, the points in the polygons and, and the likes. Yes, you can see all the data that's in the database. Uh, you just won't be able to edit the data that um, that's not not in your WFO. So you you will be able to see it all. Yeah. And that's one of the kind of one of the things that um, that one of the purposes of this is to, to make it easier to um, coordinate paths and, and stuff like that across WFO lines because we've seen that uh, a few times recently. All right, other questions. If you're testing the um, software with the data editor or the editor in the test mode only or the test site. Um, can you save those um, that data like as similar to uh, the operational side? Uh, you mean like save it as a KML or something like that, or is that what you're saying? Or 
Uh, say that, or even um, can you edit something so that, uh, okay, and then come back to it the next time? Oh, in the test database? Yeah, okay. it, yeah. It, once you put it in the test database, it'll. I mean, it'll still still be there later. It's not going to be automatically deleted or anything like that. Is that. Was that the question, or am I misunderstanding? That, that's the question. Okay. Hey, a couple questions. First off, have you changed it so that you can enter in multiple pictures per point? No, that has or, not been uh, that feature's not been added yet. No. Okay. What about the the opacity of the polygons if you draw them? Can you adjust that as well? Uh, no, I haven't done that as as yet. I had one other person that uh, kind of pointed that out as well. So that's that's another uh, feature request that we can look into is to be able. Basically, what I would envision when you click on the button up here, you'd be able to change your uh, change your opacity. So that's something we can look into as well. Parks, parks, that's built in now. Go click back on that more. Oh, okay. Is it there? Okay. Yeah, as we added it. Just click on that arrow button. Oh, okay. Click on that transparency. Okay. Hold on. Let me uh, get this out of the way here. Hold on. You can't, you can't change transparencies individually. It's all grouped together, but it will allow you to change that transparency. Oh, okay. Here we capacity. go. Okay. So let me see here. Let me zoom back out. All right. So I stand corrected there, so it looks like we can do uh, at least a little bit of that. Um, I've got one other question. Um, let's say if you had, um, uh, like in the April 27th case, uh, you had one track that, uh, or multiple tornadoes that went pretty much over the same track. Can you enter? I assume you, it sounds like you can enter, you know, you know, as long as they're under different storm names in the database, that you could do that. It wouldn't be a problem, correct? Uh, we. There, there is a bit of an issue there. We don't have it built into the web interface now with the with the storm IDs. Um, so there, right now, to be honest, there's not a real good way that you say if you wanted to extract a, a KML for each individual tra track and they were crossing o over each other, um, it's going to be actually going to be difficult to do. That's something we'll have to uh, look into um, uh, getting fixed. Now, there, if on different days, it's not a problem because you can just change the filter out. Stuff that's on a different day, but if it's on the same day and, they've got, and the tracks are crossing, then that could be an issue uh, trying to extract an individual track. Looks Any like other question? Um, about the um, adding a, a photo to an existing picture, wondering if um, you can add a, a picture that lacks GPS to an existing point in the database, and the answer is yes, you can do that. Yes, yes you don't have you to fill all the details out if the uh, right. point is already within the database. Okay, can you demonstrate that, please? Um, if you if you have a point, if you have a picture that's not doesn't have any GPS information on it, um, and you can add that to an existing point in the database, wherever that is. Can you show them how to do that, Parks? Oh, yeah, yeah. Let me the same. Let's see here. Let me click on it here. All right, so here's our point there. Zoom in on it there. Basically, you're going to, in the form here, you're going to have this attach image button. And then you can click that, basically attach the image that you want to attach to it. Click your submit edit button. And then you'll get a couple other prompts to click, <coughs> and then it'll be there. So now if we click on that again, all right, so there's the picture. So that, that picture didn't have any GPS information associated with it. It was just a, just a regular picture. Okay, thanks. This is uh, Sioux Falls. I have a question uh, regarding how long the data will be stored in the cloud. Uh, right now, I mean, it's it's um, we don't have an end time for that, sir. We're not we're not deleting any data off you know off the beginning or anything like that. Is that kind of the question or? or? Yeah, it is. And the, a follow up to that is that it, uh, what's the going to be the policy on local record retention of that same data? Um, that I don't know. That's probably more of a policy issue that will have to that'll have to be kind of hashed out. So, I mean, in the, in the end, the official data is still the what goes into storm data. Um, so this is this is kind of supplementary. 
So do you know when uh, it will be decided on when the, you know, the data is no longer in the cloud? Uh, no, I don't have. I don't apologize. I don't have an answer for that. Is there a capacity level? Uh, no, pretty much not really. No, we can. I mean, we could expand. You know, well. Very well, hey, Parks, this is Paul at Southern Region. To help answer that question, that's going to be budget-driven. Right. As of right now, we got X amount of space. If we start filling that up and they request more money for more disk space, that's where that will come in. So the answer is nobody knows yet how long it will take to fill it up. Does the cloud have backup? Yes, the cloud has backup. To build on that question about uh, storage capabilities, is there a file file size limit for pictures? Um, in the past, what we've done is we've, we've uh, tried to limit the upload size if you're uploading a picture to about uh, four megabytes. Um, theoretically, we could we could raise that limit. Um, you know, in order to kind of save storage and, and um, we've saved storage space for now, we've left that limit in place through the web editor. Uh, we'll, we'll, you know, if it turns out we don't have space issues going forward in the future, we can all, we can uh, return to that and, and maybe raise that size limit. Uh, we got a question here. Um, is there any, I guess, are there any plans to make the DAT software interactive? Like when you um, save a JPEG, it's going to be you know, a still image, but it'd be nice to have interactive maps where the photos are attached to the points on our website for the damage surveys. Um, instead of, you know, downloading the KML, uploading it in Google Earth, and then, you know, sending that image to the web. I mean, we could, I, mean, I well, guess, I mean, like, you, can, you can actually take the KML and then embed it in the web pages that you create for your storm damage, and then that KML, when it's embedded, on a Google map on your web page will be interactive. But is, the, is that capability through the data, or are we still going to have to download the KML no, first? No, I mean, that's, that's going to be however you go about creating your web page. So yeah, you'll have, you'd have to create the, create the KML and then use, use that KML when you create the, the web page. So Southern Region uh, has a web team looking at the best way to do that so. because we have to find how um, the security policies and future of web services allows us to upload those KMLs. It just seems like it almost be easier to, you know, when we're out in the field and we're uploading these photos to have somebody here at the office just download all the photos and upload them in Google Earth. That way, not only do we can we create the path, but we have the photos attached to it. Whereas, you know, each, I mean, if we have an outbreak, that server is probably going to we're going to we'll break that server with everybody trying to go to it. Actually, this is Paul. I went out and helped the Fort Worth office do a damage survey, and we did have a person sitting in the office uh, proving the images and the KMLs were generated on the fly and going as we were out doing the path. You actually do have that option now. Uh. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've kind of left it open-ended in terms of creating the web pages. I mean, we don't have a direct interface to to basically click a button in the in the DAT and create your web page for you, um, but like it's you know it's not from my experience it's not you know really real difficult to to grab a KML and and then make it into an embedded map on a web page. It's not. Uh, it, it, it's not hard parts. The problem is the new rules connecting to the Amazon cloud from our servers. You can't have a direct connect because the web servers aren't allowed to go search. And yeah, pull something off a website. Be posted a, once, you, once you extract that, that's going to be loaded uh, on Right. The, that's why we're putting, the, at Southern Region at least, we're putting together a regional team to come up with the best practice of how you do that in the right way. Okay. If I could address the question a little bit earlier on the pictures. I know one of the ways that we've done it here in Wichita, we've been using Google Maps for quite some time with uh, KML files, and we've uploaded our pictures to Picasa, and then we're actually able to put the images directly into the, the balloon associated with each point. So I would assume going this route, if we export the KML file to something we would use on our local web pages, 
we could still go through Picasa and it would tie right into that uh, KML file that you're using for your local pages. Right. I mean, the, and the KML itself is, is, you know, got a web link to the to the image on the server. So uh, I'm not sure that you even would even need to go that route, go through the Picasso route. Um, so, uh, any other any other questions? What if you have uh, two objects at the same point, and one of them, are, they have different. Um, EF ratings, EF like rating. say you have a uh, trailer house that was totally destroyed and a stick-built house right next to it that was barely damaged. They're both going to come up with an EF rating for each of those points. Well, how would you do, do that? Would they be a separate point or Yeah, you can points, make, them, you can make really them two close? separate points. You can put another point in the exact same location. That wouldn't be an issue. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Well, we'll get this um, uh, training session recorded, or we've got it recorded, and we'll get that up on the, the Google site later today uh, if you want to go look at it later. Uh, we appreciate everybody attending over the last two days. Um, hopefully we've uh, made things fairly clear for everybody. If you've got any questions, please let us know, and we'll try to answer them as best as, best as we can. So, Chris, you got anything final to say? Uh, that's all I've got for today. Thank you, everybody, for attending the webinar. And uh, again, if you have any questions, please submit it to the developers of the storm damage list. And I want to thank uh, Parks and Chris for putting this on. Good job, guys. All right, thanks, Paul. All right, everybody. Have a good one.